Welcome to the Hidden Heroes podcast. It's a collection of stories about tech pioneers who, over the past decades, laid the groundwork for the digital revolution. They, in a way, shaped the way we live, work, communicate, or travel. That's why, together with Stephen Johnson, who is the author of all the stories, we are on the mission to bring these pioneers into the spotlight and give them credit they truly deserve. In today's episode, we dive into the story of Patti Maas, a Belgian-born computer scientist and renowned MIT professor who invented the core principles of the online networks we know today. Brought to you by NetGuru. Intelligent Agent, How Patty Maas Almost Invented Social Media by Stephen Johnson. Belgian-born computer scientist Patty Maas was inventing the core principles behind the social media age when Mark Zuckerberg was still in kindergarten. Why have her contributions been neglected? Anyone who was around for the early days of the World Wide Web, before the Netscape IPO and the dot-com boom, knows that there was a strange quality to the medium back then. In many ways, the exact opposite of the way the web works today. It was oddly devoid of people. Tim Berners-Lee had conjured up a radically new way of organizing information through the core innovations of hypertext and URLs, which created a standardized way of pointing to the location of documents. But almost every web page you found yourself on back in those frontier days was frozen in the form that its author had originally intended. The words on the screen couldn't adapt to your presence and your interests as you browsed. Interacting with other humans or having conversations, all that was still what you did with email or Usenet or dial-up bulletin boards like the well. The original web was more like a magic library filled with pages that could connect to other pages through the miraculous wormholes of links. But the pages themselves were fixed, and everyone browsed alone. One of the first signs that the web might eventually escape those confines arrived in the last months of 1994, with the release of an intriguing, albeit bare-bones, prototype called Homer, short for the Helpful Online Music Recommendation Service. Homer was one of a number of related projects that emerged in the early to mid-90s out of the MIT lab of the Belgian-born computer scientist Patty Maas projects that eventually culminated in a company that Maz co-founded called Firefly. Homer pulled off a trick that was genuinely unprecedented at the time. It could make surprisingly sophisticated recommendations of music that you might like. It seemed to be capable of learning something about you as an individual. Unlike just about everything else on the web back then, Homer's pages were not one-size-fits-all. They suggested, perhaps for the first time, that this medium was capable of conveying personalized information. Firefly would then take that advance to the next level, not just recommending music, but actually connecting you to other people who shared your tastes. Moz called the underlying approach collaborative filtering, but looking back on it with more than two decades worth of hindsight, it's clear that what we were experiencing with Homer and Firefly was the very beginnings of a new kind of software platform that would change the world in the coming decades, for better and for worse. Social networks. Maas was born in the early 1960s in Brussels, the child of a doctor and a dentist. I always tell people I was not the type of kid who took apart radios and built robots, she says now, looking back on those early years. I emphasize that because when I was growing up, whenever I read an article about a computer scientist, that's what they would say. But that wasn't me. I was playing with Barbies and Legos. Arriving as an undergrad at the Free University of Brussels during the late 70s oil crisis, Maas initially gravitated towards a computer science major for entirely practical reasons. There were no jobs for kids leaving college, she says. And though I wanted to study either architecture or biology, I eventually ended up choosing computer science really for two reasons. I did realize that computers were going to be important in any domain, so I could still do biology or architecture in the future. But the other reason was purely practical. I definitely have a job when I graduated. It wasn't until she enrolled in a class on artificial intelligence that Maas found herself intellectually engaged with the material. AI was all about modeling human intelligence back then, she recalls. I thought, wow, this relates to people. 
Within a few years, she earned a PhD in artificial intelligence and moved to the U.S. to do postgraduate work at MIT, studying with AI pioneers like Rodney Brooks and Marvin Minsky. I came to visit first for like two months, and then for a year, and then the year became two years, she says. The move was a bold one for more than just geographic reasons. In the late 80s, the extended AI lab at MIT consisted of around 40 scholars. Maz was the only woman in the entire group. The late 80s and early 90s belonged to a longer period in AI research, often referred to as the AI winter, a frustrating stretch of time where the field appeared to make little progress after an early wave of hype in the 60s and 70s. Ultimately, Maz came to believe that AI back then was, quote, just creating intelligent systems for the sake of making more intelligent systems, she says now. I was always much more interested in helping people, thinking about how technology could help us with decision making and communication and finding other people that we might want to talk to, or how it could augment our memories. Working with a handful of grad students in a lab she called the Software Agents Group, Maz began exploring the ways that shared social information could generate helpful recommendations. We started this work actually before browsers existed, Maz says now with a chuckle. The first iteration revolved around science fiction novels and was entirely email-based. You sent off an email with the names of sci-fi books you liked, and the software emailed back some suggestions for further reading based on your tastes. A student of Maz named Carl Feynman, son of legendary physicist Richard Feynman, created an email recommendation system for music called Ringo. When Feynman left MIT, another grad student, Upendra Chardonnay, began working on the browser-based version, Homer, under Maz's supervision. The whole idea was really to kind of simulate the joy of going to a record store and browsing, he says now, looking back on that original project. There was something brain-tickling about the whole thing. It was all about the joy of discovery and exploration. The interaction was simple. The software offered you a random sampling of artists to rate on a scale of 1 to 7. Arrested Development, Nirvana, Van Morrison, The Sex Pistols. Once you submitted the ratings, the software would recommend a list of albums that you might like, given your tastes. In a medium defined by static information, Homer offered something different. It seemed, in a slightly uncanny way, to know a little bit about you, to have a feel for something as inchoate as musical taste. The page it served up with those music recommendations was composed on the fly. You weren't just reading through the same archived page that a thousand other people had read. Some of the artists it recommended were invariably ones you already knew, and that was impressive enough given that you were getting these recommendations from an algorithm. But the real trick was getting a recommendation that you hadn't come across before. A musician who did turn out to be in your wheelhouse once you tracked down one of their albums. Homer wasn't just a digital magic trick. It was surprisingly useful. Part of the magic lay in the fact that Homer's aesthetic sensibility was not hard-coded in advance. A programmer somewhere didn't just create a pre-existing database of artists organized by explicitly defined subgenres. Instead, the association between different artists, Pearl Jam with Soundgarden, Joni Mitchell with Neil Young, was emerging from the bottom up out of thousands of rating sets submitted by early users. Over time, the software learned to detect clusters of musical taste in all that data, a kind of transitivity principle of taste. If you liked the Pet Shop Boys, and someone else liked the Pet Shop Boys and Simple Minds, there was a higher probability that you might like Simple Minds as well. It wasn't explicit in the software yet, but there was another latent implication that Homer was predicated on. If you shared some overlapping set of cultural tastes or references with someone, then perhaps you might want to form a deeper connection with that person, that relationships between individuals could be organized and mapped statistically using databases and computer algorithms. The conventional history dates the origins of social networking back to the late 1990s and early aughts, marked by the launch of services like SixDegrees.com, Friendster, and the photo-sharing site Flickr. But many of the core ideas that would shape the social media revolution, minus the advertising model that would ultimately cause so much trouble, originated with Moz's research at the Media Lab well before then. A lot of what we did was model people and collect data, Maz says now with a wry smile. It sounds terrible now, but we thought of this as a positive thing. 
We were a little bit naive, I guess, back then, about how this would all be used in the long run. But we thought, well, if we know a little bit more about people and their interests, we can help them. Originally, Moz called the technique social filtering. But then someone said, social filtering? That sounds like Nazis, she recalls. For a while, they tried adding the word information to the phrase to make it more palatable, social information filtering. But eventually, Moz settled on a new name, one that briefly became a catchphrase of mid-90s internet culture, collaborative filtering. A paper Moz published in 1995, co-authored with Chardonnay, laid out the approach in clear language, free of the usual jargon of academic prose. Quote, we need technology to help us wade through all the information to find the items we really want and need, and to rid us of the things we do not want to be bothered with. You can sift through that information through traditional approaches like keyword filtering, but keywords were useless when trying to make more subtle assessments, like the ones that play when we like or dislike certain kinds of music. Other researchers were exploring automated ways of detecting meaning in text documents, using approaches like latent semantic indexing. But even if those techniques might be able to detect connections between articles online, they would be useless with other forms of media. Collaborative filtering took a different approach. As Maz and Chardonnay wrote in the 1995 paper, the technique, quote, essentially automates the process of word-of-mouth recommendations. Items are recommended to a user based upon values assigned by other people with similar taste. The system determines which users have similar taste via standard formulas for computing statistical correlations. The paper has now been cited almost 5,000 times in other scholarly papers that followed in its wake. Patty back then, like Patty now, as an academic advisor was really a Zen master, Chardonnay says. She was thoughtful, really listened to you, and had very insightful reactions. Before long, Maz and her students realized that collaborative filtering was useful for much more than simply recommending new artists or novels. Once you'd given the computer a sense of your personal interests and your connections to other people, all sorts of new possibilities emerged. You can tell people how unique their interests are, like how rare are the books that they're interested in, Maz explains, or who are the other people who like the same books or the same music that you like. What Maz's research began to suggest was the possibility of organizing information around people, their likes and dislikes, their interests, their social circles. This seems obvious to us now, given that some of the most valuable companies in the world are predicated on this model. But in the mid-90s, Moz had a hard time convincing anyone that this could be a viable platform for a business. Ultimately, Moz and a team of students from MIT, including Sharpandra as CTO and a recent Harvard Business School grad named Nick Grauf as CEO, decided to take matters into their own hands and start a company themselves. Quote, The whole idea of the Media Lab was always that we do the research, and then these big companies take what we invent and commercialize it, Maz says. But the big companies weren't doing that, or they weren't ready for it. So we started Firefly. Looking back from our contemporary perspective, the Firefly site, which launched in October of 1995, seems like a kind of time machine anticipating a whole set of advances that would become mainstream more than a decade later. Recommendations were a big part of it, but in order to support recommendations, we started doing profile pages, then messaging, then groups. And so we inadvertently built this social network, Sharpandra recalls. Thanks to those profile pages, you weren't just using the service to discover new bands to follow. You were using it to find interesting, like-minded people and get into conversations with them. Online communities had existed before Firefly, of course. There were bulletin boards like The Well in the 1980s and chat rooms at AOL. But Firefly was one of the first, if not the very first, to map connections between people using some kind of structured database that was built on personal information. In their case, information about your taste in music or books or movies. Soon the Firefly team began to see evidence of a phenomenon that would become commonplace in the next decade virtual connections leading to real-world relationships. We had all these marriages that came out of Firefly, actually, Maz says, because people were so excited to find other people that were into the same obscure stuff. Firefly never really took off as a business, in large part because the advertising model that would later support social networks like Facebook or Twitter simply didn't exist in the late 90s. But even in those early days, the potential for a new, 
personalized model of advertising was visible. A profile of the company in Business Week noted, quote, marketers say the software agents developed by Firefly could move them closer to their holy grail by providing a way to predict what customers are likely to want next and the means to reach them with a customized pitch that could cost a tenth of more traditional direct marketing programs. Firefly struck licensing deals with Barnes & Noble, Yahoo, and Rolling Stone, while adding new social features to the core Firefly.com site. Moz's visionary description of future intelligent agents built on collaborative filtering were published in Wired. Magazines like Time and Newsweek put her on their lists of the most influential cyber elite. She even found her way into People magazine's 50 Most Beautiful People issue in 1997, undoubtedly a first for an MIT computer scientist. Slowly, the core ideas behind collaborative filtering began to trickle out into the marketplace. Most famously in Amazon's People Who Bought This Book Also Bought This Other Book, which was one of its key features in the early days of online shopping. Soon the idea of receiving cultural recommendations based on collective data would become ubiquitous. Every time Netflix recommends a new show for you to watch or Spotify generates an automated playlist based on your recent listening history, you are enjoying the descendants of Homer and Firefly. Collecting personal information, of course, posed significant privacy problems, many of which did not have robust technical solutions in the late 90s. The team at Firefly began building sophisticated back-end user privacy and identity tools to accompany the recommendation services. Ultimately, Firefly was purchased by Microsoft in 1998, largely for those user ID technologies, which became the foundation of Microsoft Passport. The Firefly site itself was shut down in 1999, but by that time the seeds of social networking had begun to take root. Six Degrees had launched in 1997, followed by MySpace and Friendster. Just three years after Firefly went dark, a Harvard freshman named Mark Zuckerberg started toying with the idea of a social network he originally called Face Mash. The rest, as they say, is history. More than two decades later, Moz continues to work at the Media Lab, running the Fluid Interfaces group that focuses on using technology for cognitive enhancement. While the core ideas behind collaborative filtering have transformed society in positive and negative ways alike since she first began dreaming them up in the early 90s, a number of other fascinating projects she developed have still not been implemented at scale. Perhaps the most provocative idea is what Moz calls remembrance agents, software that would seamlessly augment your memory by dynamically gathering bits of information from all your various applications based on your current task. It would take all of your data, your emails, your files, even conversations that you may have taken note during, Moz explains. And every time you were in a certain new context, like I'm talking to you now, it would bring up all the notes from previous conversations that we'd had when we last met, previous emails that you might have sent to me, and so on. Bringing all the relevant context and making that available proactively so that it's a little bit easier to switch contexts and be efficient and effective. One reason that the original vision of the remembrance agent hasn't been built is that for the system to work across multiple apps, it would require a shared social database of identity so that your email client would know that your colleague Marsha was the same Marsha who had sent you a text yesterday and who collaborated with you on that Google Doc last week. But today, most of the persistent shared social graphs belong to big advertising-supported companies like Facebook or LinkedIn. If you wanted to build an underlying foundation to connect all your social interactions, to augment your memory in a seamless way, you'd have to pay the price of admission, of watching a bunch of ads for mattresses and diet pills. All of these ideas, I think they make so much sense, Moz says. But because of this whole advertising model, and because developers ultimately don't have people's interests in mind, I think that these things don't get introduced or don't get built. The remembrance agent, like her pioneering work on collaborative filtering in the 90s, has all the hallmarks of the Potty Ma's version of computing, grounded in the human side of the human-computer interaction. Looking back, it was a benefit for me that I wasn't one of those typical computer scientists who are really in love with machines in general, she says. I'm in love with people, not machines. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to our podcast so you won't miss the next Hidden Hero story. And to learn more about the Hidden Heroes publishing initiative by NetGuru, visit hiddenheroes.netguru.com. Until the next time.